Hello, and welcome to Partially Redacted, a podcast where we discuss privacy and security engineering related topics. I'm your host, Sean Faulkner, and today I'm joined by Soups Runjun, CEO and founder of Sardine, and we'll be talking about fighting fintech fraud. Soups, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean. Excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Let's start with some basics. Who are you? What's your background? And how did you end up where you are today? Yeah, so uh, I'm Soups. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of a startup called Sardine. Sardine is all about uh, making faster payments more secure, and we'll get into what that means a little bit later. And uh, prior to starting Sardine, I used to run Risk for Coinbase and then later for Revolut. Um, I have a PhD in uh, computer networks slash network security. I've spent the last 17 years of uh, my career uh, essentially just fighting uh, cyber threats, cyber security, or fighting click fraud in ad tech, and uh, most recently just fighting fintech and crypto fraud. Yeah, so you have a really extensive background in you know various forms of fraud prote- prevention. How did you actually learn about the tech, you know, the tools and techniques for fraud prevention. That's, you know, not your typical CS class that someone's going to be taking. Yeah, no. So <clears throat> fraud is not something that is taught in schools at all, right? Like fraud prevention, uh, which, which I think should change. Uh, so I, uh, I was learning, you know, I'm, I'm trained as a, uh, computer networks, uh, uh, expert. So, uh, as part of my PhD thesis, I was working on network security, which is identifying denial of service attacks that are being carried in in, in networks, right, or or some other anomalous uh, uh, network traffic patterns, which could indicate you know the presence of uh, some malicious traffic. So my first job out of grad school was essentially working for a network security company. So this is you know uh, 2005 before the term data science. Uh, even became prevalent, right? So I happened to be one of those guys who was playing with a lot of data before the term data scientist was coined. And I found that there is a, a you know, one of the greatest applications of data science is essentially uh, preventing uh, cyber threats and detecting fraud. So that's that's how I got into it. Right. And then, you know, what is, in relation to FinTechs, like, what is fraud for fintechs and you know how is that different than say fraud for something like e-commerce fraud so fraud for fintech takes multiple different flavors right so um, when i connect a bank account to my uh, fintech app to load money or when i connect like a you know a third party debit card to load money into a fintech app then uh uh, the fraud could happen from uh, yeah, uh, the, the fact that I'm using a stolen bank account or a stolen card, right? Fraud could also happen you know, when I'm doing KYC, then I'm using someone else's stolen identity, right? And then the third type of fraud that we uh, go after is essentially uh, uh, social engineering scams, right? So, which is, uh, you yeah, know, like if I got a, uh, uh, a an SMS from someone pretending to be from Chase, but except they're not from Chase, and then they 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 may actually guide me to a website which is set up to look like Chase, except uh, the A is, you know, uh, A has like an umlaw in it, right? So it looks like Chase. I go in there, I interact with it, they take my password uh, because I entered it on this phishing site, and then they go and replay it on the real Chase, right? So that's how they could steal money from me. And then uh, the fourth attack vector is, you know, uh, like I'm a neo bank. I have issued a card. Someone stole my card, and now they are spending my card. Uh, you know, going to the ATM to withdraw cash, etc. And then the fifth would be, you know, uh, essentially, you know, all these attack vectors they just blend into one. For example, I am, you know, I downloaded this neo bank app. Uh, you know, someone, you know, fished me into getting my password. And now they, uh, you know, uh, replay my password on the new bank app, you know, uh, that they again downloaded. Uh, and in this new bank app, now they are, uh, after they have logged in as me, then they create a virtual card because a lot of new banks allow you to create a virtual card uh, very quickly. And then they take this virtual card and now they add it to Apple Pay or Google Pay, right? So what happened is, like an account takeover bleeds into, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, essentially what would look like an issuing fraud. Because now somebody took over my neobank, created a virtual card, added it to Apple Pay, is now going and spending on it. Maybe they buy like something egregious, right? And I'll dispute it. But therefore, the point here being that in fintech, uh, because the funds flows are very complex, yeah, one attack can bleed into others. So long-winded answer of saying that it's, it's, uh, fintech fraud is very complicated. In the, the case where there's sort of multiple attack vectors bleeding into each other, <clears throat> there could be multiple parties potentially involved in that were part of that, uh, essentially that attack. So in the case that you were talking about where you know, someone essentially gets someone's identity and then they're getting a card issued in them and then they're you know using their card on Apple Pay or something like that. The does that is that part of the complexity essentially because there's multiple businesses that are end up being part of that you know fraudulent transaction essentially. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. That's one part of it. And then the second part of it is that uh, you asked me earlier how is fintech fraud different than e-commerce fraud? So the the couple of ways, right? So one is because you know fund flows are very complex, uh, what appears to be initially a simple account takeover or phishing ends up becoming more complicated because now they're spending money on a you know virtual card that they created out of my account, right? So now an account takeover looks like issuing fraud, right? Whereas in e-commerce, it's actually um, more straightforward in a lot of ways. It's all about you know, hey, I I stole someone's card and now you know I'm I'm you or I bought a card on a dark net market and I'm spending on that card at that e-commerce website. In the case of these complex attacks, who are the typical fraudsters? Like who is what is the profile of these individuals that are actually, you know, making these different attacks? Yeah, so the fraudsters are um depending on the attack vector, uh they vary, right? So on the one hand, you do have like um you know uh, a group of folks who are, you know, buying stolen credentials or stolen card numbers on the dark web. And then they are just, you know, downloading uh, the Neobank app and, you know, trying all these credentials against them, right? So in at Sardine, what we often observe is that uh, oftentimes, as soon as a Neobank launches, uh, the first set of customers that they attract are actually fraudsters. Uh, there's this sort of ring of uh, uh, fraudsters who are waiting, always uh, uh, observing who who is this, which new bank is being launched in the app store, and then they they go attack it, right? Um, and therefore, at Sardi, we we uh, we always say that you know, if you are launching your fintech new bank app and you don't take care of fraud from the get go, chances are really really high that you know you're gonna get burnt, and you'll get burnt really badly. Because you know, of course, card networks as well as ACH network, man, uh, which is Nacha, they all have provisions for you know how high your fraud rates can go, and if your fraud rates spike at launch, then you won't be in the good books of of these networks, and they might kick you out, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, so so that's one uh, one sort of fraud rings that we see. Happy to get into more, uh, 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 unless you know you have other questions. Well, what about in the crypto space does detecting fraud in crypto because of the way essentially the you know the blockchain works make fraud detection more even more difficult uh yeah absolutely so on the one hand you do have uh, similar attack vectors that you see in fintech fraud you see in crypto as well so for example again if i have stolen credentials then uh, i'll go create an account at a crypto exchange or if I have stole, I have a set of stolen card numbers or stolen bank account numbers, I'm gonna try them at the crypto exchange, and I'll try to buy crypto and then withdraw it immediately. Now, the more interesting thing about crypto is that because it's uh, instantly uh, withdrawable, and you know it's uh, uh, fungible, as in you know one Bitcoin and, uh, is equivalent to any other Bitcoin, and I can actually sell it very quickly. So I can liquidate it instantly. So if, and and finally, it is not reversible. So all those four factors make you know crypto uh, one of the best assets you can buy if you have stolen credentials or stolen uh, uh, card numbers, right? So in that respect, you know, I would say crypto industry typically they see much higher fraud rates, um, and therefore for a company like ours at Sardine, 
if we can solve for fraud at crypto exchanges, then we can definitely solve at any other place, right? Or in in other words, as we like to say, you know, because uh, if we grow if you grow up in a bad neighborhood, you learn a trick or two, right? And then the other thing that makes crypto very interesting is that you know uh, you also have uh, uh, you know things like uh, uh, smart contract wallets, right? So uh, yeah, like as people uh, are yeah, like as I described earlier, if you if you know scammers are trying to fish you by sending you uh, text messages which appear to be coming from a bank. Similarly, in crypto, there there are you know crypto investment scams going around, right? So crypto investment scams uh, are you know of a variety of uh, they take a variety of forms. One form could be that hey, you you basically uh, get a uh, get a message saying there's an airdrop happening. You uh, then uh, want to uh, essentially uh, get access to those tokens. So you connect your MetaMask wallet or any other you know non-custodial wallet that you have, and when you connect that wallet uh, to that website, oftentimes what consumers don't realize is that you got to pay attention as to, you know, hey, is this really, let's say, uh, uh, Polygon Studio, uh, or is this a fake site set up to appear like Polygon with an O with an umlaut instead of the regular O. So, uh, and then what the scammers do is that now the uh, now that you've connected your wallet, they will, uh, you know, uh, get you to give uh, unlimited token allowances or, you know, otherwise the smart contract could be malicious and therefore it may actually want to steal everything else that you have in your wallet, right? And what therefore means is that, you know, you got fished and then uh, all your tokens, they get stolen. But there's an even more nefarious form of it, which is that maybe you have zero balance in your in your wallet. You thought that you're getting this airdrop you interacted with a malicious smart contract. You gave it, uh, you know, some permissions which you don't even know what they are. Later, like let's say a month later, you go and try to buy crypto. You're buying crypto. You would expect that the crypto will land in your MetaMask wallet, except it actually gets drained the other direction because previously a month ago you had given some weird permission to the smart contract, which is just draining it. Yeah. Well, um, it is. <laughs> It's it's clear that a lot of these um, you know fraud attacks are pretty sophisticated and obviously like you mentioned, if you're building a fintech company, then fraud prevention needs to be something that is uh, you know P zero requirement before launch because it's super important. I mean, it's going to end up being essentially bad for business and bad for the consumer if you end up in one of these situations where your fraud rate is really really high. So given that you know you've had several prior roles in fraud prevention and now with your company Sardine, you you have extensive experience in essentially trying to counter these types of attacks. What are some of the tools and technologies that you've built to help reduce fraud? Specifically, you know, Sardine is all about you know, uh, fraud prevention uh, in high risk industries such as crypto or fintech, right? So we offer uh, uh, you know, a unified API. Uh, which takes care of you know uh, fraud in all these uh, forms that I mentioned earlier. So it could be identity fraud at account opening. It could be payment fraud when you're funding the wallet via a bank or a card. Or it could be issuing fra fraud when you're using your card uh, at a merchant, right? Uh, now, the the way we go about it is that, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, uh, referring back to one of your original questions as to how is fintech fraud different than e-commerce fraud, in e-commerce fraud, to solve for it, uh, yeah, like you have, you could essentially do a pretty good job by looking at shipping address and shopping cart analytics, right? Uh, if I'm using my card, am I adding the highest value goods to the shopping cart, and where am I shipping it to? Am I shipping it to drop shipping or a PO box, right? But now going back to fintech or crypto, you don't have shipping address and you don't have shopping cart data. All you have is users' behavior and users' device profile, and users' identity. So that is what we rely on. We we look very closely at how are you behaving when you're opening an account. Uh, am I copy pasting uh, name and email and phone number, which you know uh, a normal user wouldn't do. A normal user, all of that will be autofilled by the browser. If I stole someone's social security number, I'll probably be typing it uh, <clears throat> uh, while hesitating, while looking it up from somewhere else. So I'm context switching a lot, etc. 
But if I type my own SSL, I'm going to type it very quickly from long-term memory. So therefore, we also look at you know, typing speed. And of course, you have um, to detect a lot of these uh, uh, phishing vectors, which I alluded to earlier. A lot of these phishing vectors, they are typically targeting uh, elderly victims. They are also convincing elderly victims to install uh, you know, some other tools like TeamViewer, AnyDesk, Citrix. These are remote screen sharing tools, which the attacker would essentially uh, use to gain control of your computer or your mobile device. And then they can actually walk you through how to create an account. So they may actually control your screen, move the mouse. They may actually type on your behalf even. So uh, typically these tools are used by customer support to actually help uh, users. But now scammers have uh, taken advantage of these tools. And then at some moment, they will actually even blank out the screen so you don't even know what they're doing, except they're actually withdrawing the money into their own account, right? Now, what Sardine does is that we look at all of this behavior of how you are, you know, is somebody else controlling my screen, et cetera, and take that behavior data into account for detecting these very sophisticated phishing attacks. Yeah, that, that's terrifying, the idea of having my screen blanked out and someone drains my account. So you mentioned that you're relying on human behavior. So is this essentially you're using those as inputs into something like a machine learning model? Yeah, absolutely. So therefore, yeah. So what we do is anybody who's using Sardine, they uh, embed our SDK. Uh, uh, it's a mobile SDK as well as on in on the web. We provide like a, a, a JavaScript uh, iframe. Uh, it collects all of this user behavior uh, data as well as uh, device risk, does device risk assessment. Uh, and then second step is you make an API call to us where you pass us the PII data, like the name, email, phone number, et cetera, to us. Now, I want to caveat, the SDK is actually privacy preserving in the sense that we are not really interested in knowing what you're typing. Every single character that you type, it gets mapped to a random character. The only time when we know any PII is when you pass us data via an API call. Now, at that time, we go and augment uh, or enrich uh, your PII with about like 20 different data providers like email intelligence, social media companies, uh, you know, telcos, like who's the phone number registered to, and a variety of uh, bank or card blacklists. And then third step, we put all of this into you know, like a machine learning a model training system and train a model uh, uh, and, and give you a, a, and this model then runs in real time. So every time, every time you are now uh, opening an account at a FinTech board by Sardine or you're funding the account or you are using the card, you, you make a real time call to Sardine's uh, backend and we give you a machine learned score back in real time within a second. Hey, it's Sean, host of the show you're listening to. First and foremost, I hope you're enjoying the interview. And if you are, please support the show by subscribing and leaving a positive rating and review. And if you want to keep the conversation going, join our community at skyfo.com slash community. Okay, that's it for me. Now back to the show. Are these models customized based on behaviors that say, but the, you know, the people essentially interacting with my application or is this holistic behaviors across essentially anybody who's maybe integrating with Sardine? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a bo it's both. So uh, a new customer of ours, they get the benefit from of a consortium model, right? A model which has been trained across our entire customer base, which is about 160 plus customers right now worldwide. Um, and then uh, after yeah, they have been onboarded and they're using us, we slowly start moving them into a custom model that we train for them, right? And then eventually uh, it's steady state. Uh, it's a combination of both the consortium model and the custom model. And how does the training work? Like, where are the labels for the training coming from? Yeah, so uh, it's essentially, you know, a combination of the following things. So whenever, uh, let's say someone used my, stole my card, used it on a neobank, uh, I will find out, I'll do a chargeback, right? Uh, I'll do a chargeback with my card company, which will then go to the neobank and, you know, try to recoup the funds back from them. So therefore, the new bank is therefore receiving uh, these these chargebacks uh, on a daily basis. So those become our you know fraud labels. Then uh, the second thing is you know we also have uh, an ops team, a fraud ops team, which is uh, you know constantly reviewing uh, the accounts on 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 
uh, a sample of accounts on behalf of our customers and labeling them ourselves by catching fraudsters. And then are there ever, is this purely a machine learning approach or is there ever humans in the loop with any of this kind of stuff? Yeah, so there are humans in the loop. So the, the fraud ops team that I mentioned, right, they are essentially uh, uh, labeling accounts for our customers, right, before we even receive a chargeback. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the customization of the machine learning model based on a particular uh, business that's using Sardi, how do you know that the model is like improving over time or is that something that they're providing feedback? Like how, do, how does that sort of work? Because I imagine you're, you're continually essentially updating this model based on new learnings, but how do you know that you're sending the model in the direction that's going to actually help prevent fraud detection? Couple of different ways, right? So one, we monitor the uh, chargeback rate uh, that our customers are receiving, right? So we would expect that to continue to go down, right? Uh, number two, we uh, uh, oftentimes, yeah, you uh, if if you block a transaction from happening, right, then you run into that problem of unknown unknowns, right? Uh, if I blocked it, I would have never known if uh, this transaction would have been truly fraudulent, right? So therefore, some, oftentimes what we also do is we also let you know a, a tiny percent of traffic always continue to flow through without any intervention, right? Uh, so this way we can uh, constantly uh, measure you know what is the true fraud rate in such cases. How has your you know past experience, I guess, in the fraud space led to the actual founding of Sardine? Can you talk a little bit about sort of your your founding story for? why you decided to start a company versus, you know, continuing essentially on the career path that you're on of working in fraud detection, but not necessarily being the founder of a business? I always wanted to start a company. Um, and uh, even when, uh, you know, I was I was solving for all these interesting uh, uh, cybersecurity threats or click fraud or more recently, like fintech or crypto fraud, I, I always had this uh, thought in the back of my mind that I would want to start like a fraud prevention company. And... Uh, uh, what happened was that you know, I had already worked at two high growth startups, Coinbase and then later Revolut. Um, and I was like, you know, uh, don't want to go uh, uh, redo a high growth startup once again. I think I just want to go start something from scratch and take it from zero to infinity, right? So that's that's what you know sort of triggered me that at this stage in my career, it's this is the best time to actually start a company. Yeah, I guess going through sort of the uh... You know, the war stories of two high-growth startups, you might as well at least go <laughs> do it do it on your own from, from start to finish at that point. Either that or, you know, you retire into uh, you know, something that's a little bit more relaxing. Um, in terms of the impact that Sardine has, so what, for a business that integrates essentially this fraud detection system, how quickly are they seeing ROI in terms of reducing their fraud rate? Yeah, so the interesting thing about fraud is that uh, you don't want to bring it down all the way to zero because the only way to bring it down to zero is to kill all your volumes, right? Uh, it's uh, what you want to achieve is like a steady state uh, fraud rate, which uh, you know uh, is acceptable uh, from a margins point of view. Uh, but the reason why I say this and it's kind of counterintuitive is because yeah, like you don't want to add too much friction. Like a fraud rate of zero would mean you've added so much friction that you know, your app is barely usable. For example, I spent my first two years at Coinbase adding a ton of friction, and then the next two years actually removing a ton of it as well, right? So you want to achieve a good balance between fraud and, and friction, essentially. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, why is it that you need friction in, or you need some level of fraud to uh, um, to essentially help the system? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's counterintuitive. It's, it's basically... What the, one of the best ways of preventing fraud is to add some sort of friction, right? Like I could say, hey, uh, you know, every user uh, before they get onboarded into the fintech app has to be manually reviewed. And, you know, it'll take me one day or two days or three days for my ops team to come back and say, you're clear, right? So that is so much friction that, you know, in this day and age, no one will want to use that fintech app, right? You will have a fraud rate of zero, but your app has become unusable. The other way could be that, you know, I, I suggest to every single user who are being onboarded that uh, every single user has to not just enter or provide their social security number, 
but they also have to do documentary KYC, which is front and back of the driver license or passport or national ID card and a selfie. And, and you know, uh, uh, now like from a Bank Secrecy Act, which is BSA slash anti-money laundering. So from a BSA AML perspective, again, that's actually too much friction. Uh, BSA AML really says that all you need to do to onboard someone to a, a new bank or a bank is actually the a verified social security number and sanction screening. Right. You don't really need documentary KYC. So therefore, what uh, my point here being that yeah, uh, no one has the, the the driver license handy. They have to get up from the couch, walk to the uh, to the wallet, take it out, take a picture. You've added a lot of friction, right? So what instead you could do is let's just ask everyone to do what is required by BSA AML, which is SSN, but uh, use a system like Sardine, which gives you, you know, uh, a fraud risk score at the time of account opening, because we're gonna not just use SSN data, but we're gonna use behavior data, your device data, right? Like, did you copy paste your SSN? Did you type it fast? All of that kind of stuff. And then on the basis of that, we tell you, this is a user on whom you should add more friction, as in get them to go through documentary KYC to really establish if they are they if they are who they say they are. And these vast majority of users, they are fine by the machine learning model and the risk score given by Sardine. Let them be onboarded. Right. Does that does that help answer the question? Yeah, no, that's super helpful. I, I get it. So I mean it sounds like a lot of it is if in or basically in order to have like a perfect system for detecting fraud you would need to collect so much information from someone that you're adding so much friction to your system that no one's actually going to do it. Like if you needed to validate someone's home address by sending them a, a postcard and then they have to wait a week to get a postcard and they're responded by a postcard or something like, you know, something crazy like that, then no one's ever going to actually do a transaction in your system because it's there's just so much friction involved. It's similar to, you know, something like, um, you know, generating uh, leads for a business, qualified leads for a business. You need to balance essentially ease of collecting the information with giving enough information to actually qualify that lead. Yeah. Yep. So for companies that are, you know, starting out maybe in the FinTech space that what is the sort of the evolution of fraud detection that they typically go through? Are they initially trying to, you know, DIY something? Um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, there are a lot of folks, uh, come to fintech from other spaces, right? And um, in other areas of, you know, entrepreneurship, right? Like the idea is to typically launch something quickly and then iterate, right? But what I have realized is that in fintech, you can't really do it, right? You can't really do DIY when it comes to fraud. Just like, you know, you don't, uh, at the Skyflow, right? Your pitches, uh, yeah, you don't want to, uh, no, no one should be rolling out their own uh uh, you know, PCI compliance, you use a provider like Skyflow, right? So we are seeing a shift where, you know, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we realize that, you know, fintech entrepreneurs, they should really just focus on quickly building and launching their startup and, uh, you know, achieving scale and achieving product market fit. The fraud and compliance issues, uh, just like they've been handing over PCI compliance to providers like Skyflow, for fraud prevention as well, it's they would be much better off if they relied on an expert in the space instead of doing DIY, uh, because you know you'll quickly get your hands burned and you'll realize that you know it's a never-ending game of fighting fraud, right? It's 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 a cat and mouse game, so why not just outsource it and then uh, go and focus on on building the best product experience you can? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you did a good job of in you know in this conversation of making a case for why this is essentially the results of fraud are bad for business, bad for consumer, but also just the sheer complexity of trying to understand all the potential attacks that can happen. It's not something that unless you have deep expertise in that you would probably want to take on, That's not, especially when it's not core to your business. What are some of your thoughts on you know, the future of fraud detection? Is this something that we're getting better at actually preventing or is you know things like new technologies like, uh, you know, the crypto space or, you know, just more people moving the cloud, we're actually in a place where fraud is getting worse. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I would argue, no, as an industry, uh, we are not getting at getting better at fraud for the following reason, that uh, 
as as the industry actually uh, moves towards faster payment methods, right, uh, which is like UPI in India or PIX in Brazil, faster payments in UK, and then Zelle, RTP, and FedNow in the US. What I'm concerned about is that you know with these faster payment methods, you'll have faster fraud. Just like in crypto, we crypto was a bellwether, right? Uh, because in crypto you could move money instantly, not reversible, it's fungible. So therefore, it attracted the 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 most sophisticated scammers and fraudsters. I my my hypothesis is that as these faster payment methods take off, all the fraud fraudsters are gonna move over uh, in into these new faster payment methods, and new types of uh, attack vectors will become more popular. Right? Like we're already seeing it. Yeah, like these these phishing texts that I was alluding to, right? Scams essentially, they will actually overtake uh, card fraud, right? And it already has happened in the UK. In the UK, uh, uh, dollars lost by consumers to uh, uh, faster payment fraud uh, has actually overtaken credit card fraud losses, right? And um, just like you know, in any industry, uh, you know. Uh, Whenever you launch something new, you have to actually understand its full repercussions, right? So I think we are at this turning point in in financial uh, sort of industry worldwide, where everyone is moving to these faster payment methods. So my thesis is that you know the problem is actually not going to get easier; it's actually going to get worse before we can actually figure out how to solve for it, and then it becomes easier. Right? Yeah. It's it's like the speed of innovation is moving so quickly that. Uh, it also is going to attract essentially innovation from a fraud uh, standpoint. Exactly. Yeah. The fraud is very creative. Are there, you know, tools or technologies that are maybe, you know, five to 10 years away that could help with this problem that you're particularly excited about? Or do you think this is something that is just going to take essentially more work to get to a place where we're, we get a handle on this problem? Actually, yeah, uh, uh, I've been thinking quite a lot about this. Uh, the the issue of uh, you know fraud prevention uh, you know it's 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 not something that you can fight in isolation. It's not just a problem that banks and the card networks should be worried about. Uh, it requires actually like a f uh, it it all comes from a fundamental flaw in the way even we design the internet uh, in the following way that you know today uh, when you receive a text message, how do you know that it actually came from uh, your bank? If you receive a call from your bank, how do you really know it's your bank calling you, right? So the issue at hand here is that identity is kind of broken, uh, and it's it's not just the fact that you know the the cellular networks cannot really convince us that you know it's it's Sean calling me, right? Uh, uh, and the reason they can't do that is that if you look at the protocol level, you know SIP, which is you know standard internet telephony protocol. You know, uh, there, uh, the, the, there is no verification done at the source of, you know, someone who's originating a call, right? Or someone who's originating uh, the text message. No one verifies the sender. Similarly, in DNS, you know, you, you, you know, uh, DNS security or DNS sec was not adopted. Uh, I, I could go on and on like BGP, BGP security or BGP sec, the protocol was not adopted. No one verifies the originator of anything in the internet today let alone, you know, text messages or phone calls. And therefore, that is a fundamental problem why, you know, uh, folks, consumers get fished uh, by by scammers, right? Yeah, I mean, SMS is uh, almost like a 30-year-old technology at this point. It was never, ever built for the uses that's being used for today. And, it, you know, and, and there's a ton of inherent um, security issues with, with SMS. Actually, two products I worked on in my time at Google we're actually trying to address this problem of identity from SMS and also calls. So there was a, a products I worked on verified SMS and verified calls that were attempting to essentially bring identity to both of those protocols, but it's a really, really hard problem to solve. And then the go to market is really, really difficult as well. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. So I, I, I think, um, uh, it's, 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 it's a very, uh, very hard problem. Uh, so now like if you look at Zell. Zell scans, right? They have taken off like anything. So yeah, uh, uh, if I'm receiving a uh, a text message from someone asking me for money, how do I know that they're who they say they are? Because you know, it's not really a bank problem; it's really the identity problem. Like, 
as I said, it's telco identity, it's the SMS identity. How do we know who who they are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so as we sort of wrap up, is there is there anything else that you'd like to share about you know Sardine or about some some of the you know learnings that you had over your years working in in fraud detection? The thesis for Sardine is the following: that you know, uh, uh, if you really think about it, when it comes to money movement. Uh, making it faster and secure and also for making it cheaper, you know, the most important thing that is standing in the way of all of that is really fraud and uh, uh, better fraud prevention, right? And better compliance, right? Better money laundering detection, better KYC, et cetera. So our mission is to, you know, make the cost of uh, payments uh, get lower and make uh, payments faster and more secure by taking care of fraud and compliance, right? Uh, so in that on that note, right, uh, we are hiring many different roles open on our website. If anyone wants to come join us in our mission, we'd, we'd, love, uh, we'd love to have you. Awesome. Yeah, I will include a link to that in the show notes. But uh, Soups, thanks so much for being here. I think this is uh, such a fascinating, really, you know, complex subject when you start to dig in. And I really appreciate you sharing so much of the, you know, techniques you've learned and, and developed to reduce fintech fraud and, and appreciate the work that you're doing at Sardine. I wish you all the best of luck, of course, with the company. Um, but cheers and thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me.